On this royal hill, overlooking a valley through which the river Store flows, lies the chapel of St. Stephen, which according to chronicles was built on the site of where Edmund the Martyr was first crowned king on Christmas Day in 855 AD. He later became England's first patron saint and a cult developed around him and his memory. Little records today exist of this event or indeed any documentation chartering his life due to the turbulent wars England was suffering through Viking incursions who in the course of their activities would have destroyed any hard copy books or manuscripts left by the fleeing English. It was mostly from the chronicler Geoffrey of Wales that we learn of this story when writing around 1150 AD that Edmund was consecrated and anointed king at Burham, an ancient royal hill, the known bound between East Essex and Suffolk and situated on the River Stour. Burham would presumably be a variation of the name Bewards, the nearby village straddling both counties which stands today. He also described quite accurately the location, adding that the river flowed rapidly in both summer and winter, which is a fact that can be easily attested by any visitor. In fact, today it is easy to visualize the landscape of this era, and seemingly little has been encroached upon by the modern world, save for the Bure's dragon carved into the hill below, of which I will explain more about later. The present stone building was built in the 13th century as a memorial chapel by Gilbert de Tourney, a local landowner. It probably replaced an earlier Saxon wooden chapel and the structure was consecrated by the Archbishop of Canterbury and Cardinal of Rome, Stephen Langton, on St. Stephen's Day in 1218 AD. For such a popular place of pilgrimage and worship, its future seemed self-assured by its importance until the dissolution of the Catholic Church by Henry VIII, where it was abandoned and left in a dilapidated condition. But like other former religious buildings that survived the Protestants, it had an alternative use and was spared. It also served as a plague hospital, a school and farm workers cottages before finally being employed as a barn in the early 20th century, where a wealthy Isabel Badcock purchased it along with the house and surrounding land. Upon entering this chapel, the light from the medieval lancet windows glows over three knightly tombs, which gives the impression that the chapel was originally built to house them. Of course, nothing could be further than the truth, as these were added in 1935 by Colonel William Probert, who had inherited Colm Priory in Earlscone, Essex. Probert, who had his own home in Bures, decided to sell the Priory, and as he was by then in the middle of restoring St. Stephen's Chapel with his sister-in-law, Isabel Badcock, he removed the tombs from Colm Priory to St. Stephen's Chapel. Shortly afterwards, they were joined by the slab of Alberic de Vere, father of the first Earl of Oxford, and the first of the line to bear the office of Lord Great Chamberlain. The slab had apparently been found in a rock garden in Earl's Cone, and in recent years a sarcophagus was discovered in a wood at Cone Park. Each of the named tombs bear the effigies of Robert de Vere, 5th Earl of Oxford, died in 1296, which has OG arch niches on the sides. Another is to Thomas de Vere, the 8th Earl of Oxford, died 1371, which also has OG arch niches on the sides. And the third is to Richard de Vere, died 1417, and his wife Alice, and that is made from alabaster. All of the tombs have recumbent figures. Adding these to the chapel has certainly created a richness which adds to the medieval ambience, which oozes an appeal that enthralls many visitors to the building each year.
I mentioned earlier the local landmark known as the Buer's Dragon. This representation was created in 2012 and is only clearly viewable from the chapel and its design was drawn from the 15th century depiction painted on the north wall inside nearby Whissington Church. The fact it was painted over pre-existing wall paintings certainly indicates it was very topical for the period. Its origin as a legend is drawn from an event in 1405 and was chronicled thus. Close to the town of Bures near Sudbury, there has lately appeared to the great hurt of the countryside a dragon, vast in body with a crested head, teeth like a saw, and a tail extending to an enormous length. Having slaughtered the shepherd of a flock, it devoured many sheep. In order to destroy him, all the country people around were summoned. But when the dragon saw that he was again to be assailed with arrows, he fled into a marsh or mere, and there he hid himself amongst the long reeds and was no more seen. It is believed in certain camps that the dragon was actually a crocodile given to Richard I of England as a gift by Saladin on his crusades to the Holy Land. It was suggested that it escaped from the Royal Menagerie in the Tower of London and somehow travelled 80 odd miles along the East Anglian coastline before entering the River Stour near the present day Manning Tree before swimming upriver towards Bures. What makes that legend less believable is the fact that the crocodile, for some reason, ignored many similar habitats to travel so far in search of prey. More believable is the suggestion that the dragon was brought to Bures by a crusader from the local Liston family, returning from the Holy Land. It is claimed it grew too big before eventually escaping into the River Stour. It terrorised the villagers and eventually dived into the river and swam downstream towards Wormingford and was never to be seen again. Another legend suggests it was killed by Sir John Marney from Leah Marney in Essex. And lastly, some 40 odd years later, this report was chronicled. On Friday the 26th of September, 1449, two reptiles were seen fighting on the banks of the River Stour and near the village of Little Cornard, which marked the English county borders of Suffolk and Essex. One was black and the other reddish and spotted. After an hour-long struggle that took place and to the admiration of many of the locals beholding them, the black monster yielded and returned to its lair, the scene of the conflict being known ever since as Sharp Fight Meadow. There are many conflations to this story due in part to its popularity and today all that can be agreed is that it was probably a crocodile taken from the Crusades and more likely to have been removed from the River Nile. But the story is now embedded into legend and forever it will remain as the Bure's Dragon. It is worthy of note that the dragon as an emblematic image was once the flag of Edmund the Martyr, before being replaced as a patron saint of England by St George, who too coincidentally slew a dragon. Ordinarily that would be as far as my little presentation can go on the history of this wonderful chapel and site, but of course it seemingly doesn't end there. While I was setting up a camera to video a static shot of the nave, I unintentionally caught on camera this anomalous activity by an open doorway on the right which leads to the gallery staircase and entrance. The area is indicated by an arrow. And here is the shot as captured originally and with audio for clarity. and repeated once more. And now here is a close-up of this activity which appears to show on the right a light form in the shape of a human finger beckoning two other light forms to enter into the doorway from the left. And repeated and slowed. I've studied this clip in great detail and of course I am also mindful of the location and whether or not it could somehow be explained by other activity on the outside of the property. Firstly, there were no obstructions with shiny surfaces outside the chapel which could give an account for this. 
Secondly, the site is very remote and on the side affected from the Lancet windows to the left, it has an open aspect which faces into a steep valley and towards the River Stour. And lastly, there were no other humans or even vehicles present, which would have been heard on the audio. And the faint whistle was actually myself. Paranormal? Well, only you can decide, but the hard rule of accepting it to be paranormal is whether or not it can be firstly and logically explained away. And in this example, it cannot, and is therefore, in my opinion, presumed to be a paranormal event. Of course, regardless of whatever deductions you can arrive at, others may feel differently, and in those circumstances one would expect detractors to offer a feasible challenge to such contentions. I personally cannot find any. The tomb edifices are, I believe, without bodies, but the history of so many centuries must have left an indelible mark within the fabric of this ancient place. And so that is it from me today. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and will, of course, subscribe by clicking the bell icon to receive updates of any new shows. Thank you.